Good morning. Good morning. Please stand if you are able for the public worship. I waited patiently for the Lord. He, he turned, turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He, he set, set my feet on a rock and gave my feet a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Let us worship his name. Please remain standing for the hymn of praise. How great thou art, number 147. <laughs>
please join me in the prayer of invocation. Heavenly Father, we pray that we may be patient in every circumstance of life and develop the patient endurance that perfects our faith through the trials we face and the way we live. Keep us from developing a worldly perspective and wrong values, and help us to be like the farmer who waits for the precious produce of the soil to bring forth its fruit in due season. Keep us from doubt and uncertainty, and help us trust you in all things, and to finish the good work you started in our lives. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's scriptural reading is from James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Thanks be to God.
So, um, title of this series is Brian's Experiences in the Grocery Store. <laughs> this week I decided, because I decide very early in the morning what I'm going to have for dinner. It's a very important decision for me, part of my devotion. I decided I wanted to make enchiladas. And so I looked at all these recipes, you know, and I thought, I'm going to make homemade enchilada sauce. None of this canned stuff for me. And as our intentions are good in the morning, as the day wanes on, sometimes not so much. So I got to the store earlier to make homemade enchilada sauce. I got everything I needed. And then when I came home from work, I'm like, Ugh, I'm not making all that. I'm going to run out to the store and get what I need. Well, nothing is worse than having to go out to the store in this weather, in this cold and when you're already home, you know, it's one thing to stop, that's irritating enough, but now I gotta go back out. And of course, you know, the dog gives me the sad eyes because I'm leaving her forever, you know, for five minutes. And so I get to the store and all I need is enchilada sauce and sour cream. That's all I need. So in front of the enchilada sauce aisle, which is very short, is this older lady, probably in her 80s, oddly dressed. She has on sweatpants that are about this too much long for her and tennis shoes and this very long cashmere dress coat and long, long hair and a ponytail up. She was sort of a character of herself and she was just staring at the Mexican aisle. So I made up my mind when COVID started and by golly, I was going to stick to it, that I was going to be patient in the stores. I was not going to say, excuse me, I wasn't going to say anything, I wasn't going to do anything. And I've been abided by that for the most part in terms of politeness. So I stood there for quite a while, and then I went, <clears throat> and she stared. There was nothing. And I thought, oh, just go get your sour cream. So I moseyed to the back of the store to get my sour cream, got it maybe a couple other things diluted, came back and the same woman is still standing there staring at the refried beans. <laughs> so I say, excuse me, I just need to get this, but I really don't know what to get because I can't see if she's in my way. And she turned and she stared at me for the longest time. And I said, I just need to get my things if you can move out of my way, it'd be so great. And she's like, okay, why didn't you say something? And she walked away from me. Nobody likes to wait. <laughs> Nobody likes to wait, and that's the truth. And how many of you ever seen the teaser on Facebook? And, and it'll be something like uh, a baby gets a, a, a colloquial implant for the first time, hears its mother's voice. And, um, or uh, uh, a, a dog rides a skateboard through the park or something like that. And there's always this little teaser and it says, wait for it so you don't leave it before you go. Wait for it is also cautionary. We're conditioned for quick responses. We might draw the wrong conclusion that a video isn't worth watching towards the end, only to miss a memorable moment. And then we hear all the laughters and delights from Glees for those who stayed to watch it. And we quickly return and say, what's so funny? What I miss? I didn't wait for it. Somewhere in your mind, you determined that another 15 seconds was just too much to give. You walked away determining that the wait wasn't worth it. We have a natural negative perspective on waiting. We don't like to why and why at the Department of Motor Vehicles. A website doesn't load that doesn't load quickly or being placed on hold with that annoying music that's unidentifiable or learning that your Amazon package which you have great faith in because you're a prime member is not going to come in one day but delayed another day one of life's greatest trials <laughs> <laughs> most of what we have on a day-to-day -day involves waiting stoplights traffic jams pregnancy callbacks for a play posting of grades a meaningful relationship a job offer medical test call from a wayward child Waiting is hardwired into our humanity, and every day that we live, we find that there is an opportunity to wait. But waiting is not just a part of humanity, it's a part of Christianity. But not in the same way. The Bible, the waiting is commended and commanded. And like so many other things, like suffering and the crucifixion, God aims to transform our waiting. That's why the New Testament and the Old Testament talk about it so often. 
The Bible identifies seasons of waiting as something helpful, even spiritual. Patience is productive. Endurance is a calling. But that's not how we always naturally think, is it? It's easy to think that waiting is a waste of time. So once again, James, in this book, as we wind down, and there are only two more sermons left in the book of James for those who are tired of waiting, <laughs> instructs us to go the opposite direction of both the world system and our natural inclinations. He cautions us in the chapter that we talked about, about using the dark arts to get what we want. He tells us in 120 to not let anger win the day. He says to be slow to speak and quick to listen in 119. And in chapter 4, he says, try not to speak in a way that negates God's sovereignty. We've learned a lot of practical Christianity in the book of James. So in this text, 5, 7 through 8, James returns to the theme of spiritual endurance. And remember, this is how he began the book. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And the steadfastness will have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I, I have to, uh, this is a part of my notes, but I have to tell you that word perfect is the Greek word maturion, which actually is translated mature. It means that you will become mature. It doesn't mean perfect like, you know, Nancy's hair. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now everyone's staring at her hair. <laughs> there is the Lord right there. So we have three truths to remember when life is hard because that's when it gets the hardest to become patient. That first of all, waiting is commanded. Here it is, right there in the text. If you turn in your bulletin to your text, it says right away, be patient therefore until the coming of the Lord. Be patient therefore until the coming of the Lord. The fact that he says therefore means he's connecting this verse to the previous ones about the danger of riches. Remember last week we talked about the danger of being rich and how money could be deceptive and misused. So James' readers were more likely to be on the receiving end of the unfair treatment of the wealthy. They were facing hardship and the second a situation seemed hopeless. A lot of them were getting evicted from their homes. They were losing their houses. They were in the midst of a famine. They were starving. Because he says, brothers, it's clear he's writing to Christians. So when we convince ourselves that waiting is a waste, it's easy to justify all kinds of sinful responses. How many have ever done something this as a pass to say something that we shouldn't say? I'm sorry, I'm just so frustrated. And that gives you a pass to say whatever you want or do whatever you want. So imagine and when you stand before the throne and Jesus says, why did you say that to so-and-so in 2022? And you say, well, Jesus, I was just so frustrated. And he's like, oh, I get it. Okay, that's good. Good job. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. I'm frustrated. Or I'm scared. Or I'm sick of this. Or I want my life back. Or it's hopeless. And one of the ways this text can be extremely helpful to remind you that there are alternatives to being sinful. Your option, your only option, is never just to sin. So what's the alternative? He says, be patient. Just two words, but they are incredibly important. And let's, it's talked three times in the next two verses, so let's start with the meaning. The meaning of patience means long-suffering. Um, it's the idea of hanging in there. Uh, to understand patience or seasons of spiritual waiting, to suffer means you're experiencing something hard, and there would be a natural, normal tendency to have an acceptable duration in mind. No one expects life to be easy, but patience or long-suffering means that you set your expectations or the requirements for the extent of the future. Let me give you an example. Whenever I get a cold, somewhere along the line, somebody told me a cold is three days coming, three days with it, and three days leaving. If my call cold goes beyond nine days, I'm immediately saying, what's going on here? I'm still coughing. Because I have set... All, uh, an expectation that all viruses, no matter what they are, should only last nine days. And anything beyond that nine days is not fair to me. A traffic light. Oh. Oh. If the traffic light were only two seconds, it would be a traffic light. It would be a yield. But there are certain areas where traffic lights are very, very, very long. And I know that, and so I start going 30 miles over the speed limit when I see a green light just in case I don't catch that light. Because I have an expectation of how, much, how long I should have to wait for that uh, traffic light. 
Now, here's what's so great about what James says in this verse. Look at what he made our expectation. Not three minutes for a traffic light, not days for a cold. He said, until the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. Because that expectation is we don't know when that's going to happen. So you're just required to be patient. But what it does tell us is it gives us hope, too, that when Jesus comes back, and Jesus is going to come back, he is going to return, all things will be made right, including whatever your long-suffering is right now and your patience. You know, like when you're making cookies, there's an expectation. you got to put all the ingredients together. you got to shop for the ingredients. And by the way, the reason why I hate the grocery store so much is because of what it represents. And you all understand this. It represents, first of all, we have to spend a money, and right now, a lot of money. Then we have to go home and we have to put it away. Then we have to cook it. And then we have to clean up the mess. And then we have to exercise to work off the food that we <laughs> eat. So you see, it, it, it's why I, I come mostly unglued in the grocery store. But when you're making cookies... You know that you have to bake the cookies and there's a certain time. A child, a three-year-old tired, might not know that. They're immature and they'll say, what's taking so long? And you say, well, honey, the, the cookies have to bake. You know, 20 minutes or however long cookies have to bake. Um, but what if your oven wouldn't heat beyond 100 degrees in three, four hours to bake the cookies? And you'd be saying, we got to get a new oven. This is ridiculous. Patience and perspective are linked together. And that's the problem, isn't it? Our patience runs out based upon the limitations of our perspective. And that's why James says, until the coming of the Lord. And that's why patience can be commanded. It looks beyond our perspective and our expectations. Waiting humbly acknowledges my ability to not be in control. Your life isn't out of control. You're just not in control of your life. And that's what bugs you when you're not in control. And that's why people get impatient. <clears throat> ben Patterson summarizes this well when he writes, waiting is not just a thing we have to do until we get what we hope for. Waiting is part of the process of becoming what we hope for. And this way, patience, waiting and patience is an active way that expresses obedience to God. Patience isn't the last resort. Waiting aims my need to be in control to take revenge or to become bitter. Patience is an act of war against my self-sufficiency, and that's why it's commanded. Over and over and over and over and over in the Bible and in the New Testament and the power of the gospel lens, we see that we are reliant on God. And our opportunity to be patient demonstrates our ability to rely on the fact that God is sovereign. It doesn't matter if Putin is in Ukraine, God is still on the throne. And we may not understand what is going on. But if we are reliant on him, he will hold us up. Secondly, waiting is common. All through the Bible, there is waiting. And he says, he uses in chapter 7 the illustration of farming. And they would have all understood that because most of them were farmers at the Jerusalem church. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. The farmer always learns to wait. He plants, he grows, he seeds, and then he just waits. And he's reliant on the early rain to germinate the seeds, and he's reliant on the uh, late rain to make the harvest grow. And he has no control over it, does he? Not one bit. So he just has to wait. Sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But most of the time while he's waiting, what does happen? Seeds germinate, seeds grow, and harvest comes in abundance. James invites us to consider this example to learn how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. What is happening? The harvest is growing while the farmer waits. Isaiah 64, 4 says, From of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. James' point is simply that the farmer lives this way waiting, and a Christian should live like this as well. It should surprise us at how much waiting surprises and frustrates us. Waiting is not just a part of the created world of farmer, but much of the Bible. Wait, listen to this. God designed every day to include a morning and evening, and he adorns sleep, or James sleep is one. We sleep anticipating waking up. You ever gone to bed sick, and you just think, oh, I can't wait for this night to be over because you can't sleep, and it's just the longest night in the world? 
it's not the longest night in the world when you crash out and sleep really good though, is it? It's like this, you wake up. Yeah. Noah waits inside the ark as the water subsided with the flood in Genesis 8, 10 through 12. Abraham and Sarah waited for years for their promised son. Moses waited 40 years in the desert before receiving the burning bush calling. The deliverance to the Red Sea required waiting on the Lord to act. The giving of the Ten Commandments involved waiting 40 days and the failure of the golden calf happened because of a failure to wait. Remember that story? They said, this man come Moses. We don't know what happened to him. He hasn't come down for the money. So that the Israelites got together, put all the gold together, got a golden calf and worshipped the golden calf. Saul was disqualified as king because he failed to wait. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness before the launch of his ministries. And we could go on and on. And even the gospel itself, the crucifixion, Jesus could have had but died and two seconds later been raised. But what did God do? Three days. We waited three days. How long did we wait for Jesus to be born? The incarnation of the Son of God. 600 years where the law had become cold and silent. 2 Peter 3, 11 through 14 says, Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth on which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent, and to be found by him without spot or blemish, and at peace. Do you see how much waiting and patience are built into both the created order and plan of God? Waiting is so common in the Bible, it ought to be surprised when waiting isn't a major part of the equation. Claudia Pebble in Why We Hate to Wait writes, Waiting, according to the collective experience in Western culture, is considered to be an imposition. Anyone who has to wait for a delayed train or a plane or an appointment or a free table in a restaurant becomes impatient, often angry, and sometimes aggressive. Writes Cologne-based author Andrea Bossi, apparently it doesn't work to see waiting as a gift of time. Instead of enjoying it, it becomes torture. But what if Christians could look at waiting differently? What if we saw it as commanded? What if we saw it as commanded and common and courageous? What if we welcomed the opportunity to wait? Instead of waiting at the last resort, James does calls us to embrace patience, to establish our hearts. Let's look, unpack that for a second. The reason why we do this is because he tells us the coming of the Lord is at hand. And once again, James points to a theological co commitment or a belief system. He's reminding us that the Lord's return is going to happen. Victory is assured. This kind of waiting refuses to live as Jesus is dead. It courageously pushes us against the natural tendency to only focus on what we can see and what we perceive. This kind of waiting stakes at his claim in the future and not in the present. If embracing patience as a command requires obedience, and if understanding that waiting is common necessitates wisdom, seeing waiting as courageous takes faith. It takes faith to embrace waiting. You've been given a diagnosis of cancer. You can't get into the oncologist for two months. It takes faith to wait. The Bible tells us that if we wait and we're patient, that God will strengthen us. And it's 1 Peter 5, 10 through 11. And after you've suffered for a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will him store, restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you to him be dominion forever and forever. One of the most courageous things that you can do is to wait patiently. The psalmist writes, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Love the Lord, all you saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong, let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. And our call to worship was taken from Psalm 40 today. And it goes like this. I waited patiently for the Lord, he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and made my steps secure. 
He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. When things are going well and you're so blessed, you don't need Psalm 40, do you? But when the doctor gives a bad diagnosis, you need to cling to Psalm 40. When your spouse tells you they don't want to be married anymore, you want to cling to Psalm 40. When you check the stock report and found out that half of your retirement has fallen away, you need to cling to Psalm 40. Don't you see it? Waiting is not a waste. Patience is not pointless. It's commanded, it's common, and it's courageous and takes faith. trustees and those who are making decisions that everything would be according to your will and for the betterment of your kingdom. We thank you that all gifts come from you and we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love. We pray this morning that you would be with those in our body and friends and relatives of those in our body who we petition for, for either health, <clears throat> a lot of cancer and COVID and distress or emotional need financial need or grieving. Pray for my own brother-in-law who lost his brother this week, Gary Nunnery. Pray for my niece and nephew who are grieving. Pray for Tom Schlaff recovering at home from a fall. For Tracy Dodes, cancer. Mary Clough, cancer. 
the mother of Kevin Shelby, D. Shelby, for this baby who is still awaiting a heart transplant, Caden, for Joanne Heron for cancer, Cindy Toma for cancer, Michelle Campo for cancer, for Lou Worthington, that you continue to keep him cancer free, for our shut ins, Pat Stecko, and Sue Wilson, and Carrie Gold, and Goldie, and Lois Klickner, we pray. And we offer these prayers to you in the name of the one who taught his apostles how to pray by saying, Our Father, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Why is these things always different? I don't know. Better song anyway. <laughs> <laughs>